3. We'll read from verse 1 to verse 11. Ruth 3 from verse 1 to verse 11. Then her mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, meaning Ruth, my daughter, shall I not seek security for you that it may go well for you? Now then, is Boaz not our relative with whose young woman you were? Behold, he is winnowing barley at the threshing floor tonight. Wash yourself, therefore, anoint yourself, put on your best clothes, and go down to the threshing floor. But do not reveal yourself to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. And it shall be when he lies down that you shall take notice of the place where he lies. And you shall go and uncover his feet and lie down. And then he will tell you what you should do. And she said to her, all that you say I will do. And so she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law had commanded her. When Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was cheerful, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. And she came secretly and uncovered his feet and lay down. And it happened in the middle of the night that the man was startled and bent forward. And behold, a woman was lying at his feet. And so he said, Who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your slave. I'll spread your garment over your slave, for you are a redeemer. And then he said, may you be blessed of the Lord, my daughter. You have shown your last kindness to be better than the first by not going after young men, whether rich or poor. So now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you whatever you say. For all my people... In this city, know that you are a woman of excellence. But now, although it is true that I am a redeemer, yet there is also a redeemer more closely related than I. Remain this night, and when morning comes, if he will redeem you, good, let him redeem you. But if he does not wish to redeem you, then I will redeem you. As the Lord lives, lie down until morning." And so she laid at his feet until morning and got up before one person could recognize another. And he said, do not let it be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. Again, he said, give me the shawl that is on you and hold it. And so she held it and he measured six measures of barley and laid it on her. And then she went into the city. When she came to her mother-in-law, she said, how did it go, my daughter? And she told her all that the man had done for her. And she also said, these six measures of barley he gave to me. For he said, do not go to your mother-in-law empty-handed. And Then she said, wait, my daughter, until you know how the matter turns out. For the man will not rest until he has settled it today. And Father, we thank you for this opportunity once again of just going into this precious book and this precious portion of your word, the book of Ruth. We ask for wisdom, we ask for insight, and I pray that you would etch your word in our hearts, that we would do your will. Thank you for making us hearers and doers of your word. That is so important. In a time of great confusion, we want to be, O oh Lord, obedient to you. We want to be carried away by every wind of doctrine. We don't want to give ear to the spirits of this age. We want to be closely aligned with your will. And so I pray you would grant us grace to do that so that we could honor you and, and grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord. Thank you for the wonderful people of God that have come here this afternoon. Grant each one of us grace that, mu that much that is needed so we can please you throughout the course of this week. This I pray in the wonderful and glorious name of our Lord. Amen. Please be seated, beloved. So last week we saw that Ruth um, came into this field of grace, and there she discovered 
something far more than just a bit of barley or a bit of wheat. There she discovered serendipity. She discovered that God had revealed his grace to her by allowing her to meet this generous man by the name of Boaz. So when she gets home from the fields of Boaz, from these fields of grace, um, and Naomi sees the abundance of barley and grain that she had gathered following the gatherers, right? The sheaves that would fall down. They purposely let loads just fall nearby Naomi, so could, uh, Ruth rather, so Ruth would pick these up. And she had three-fifths of an ephah, which was quite a bit, right? And so she brings this back home, and Naomi is, is pleasantly surprised. And so here we see Ruth receiving counsel from Naomi. Naomi doesn't lose this eureka moment. She goes, we have to act, and we have to act now. She was a wise woman. She had foresight and the wisdom to say what needed to be said at that moment. Ruth didn't know what to do. Remember, she was a Moabite that had converted to the faith of Israel, the faith of God's people. She had learned as much as her mother-in-law was teaching her. So basically, Naomi was Ruth's teacher. And so Naomi felt that Ruth was in a very unique position. She was a widow, a childless widow. Their inheritance as land was in jeopardy. If they didn't redeem it back, it would go to the nearest of kin. So they would have no one that would actually, from their uh, husband or, or her husband or her um, daughter-in-law's husband, that would actually take care of the field. It would not go down to their, their descendants, so it would be passed on to the next of kin. So it would go lost from their family. And so Naomi had the insight to say, we need to act. Here's Boaz that is a relative. It is not by chance that Ruth wandered into his field. And it's not by chance that Boaz noticed this Moabite woman, that he noticed Ruth and started to show generosity and kindness towards her. So Naomi may have thought, since Boaz is impressed with the fear of the Lord and the kindness that Ruth has shown to Naomi, he may be even, who knows, maybe even attracted. But whether he's attracted or not to Ruth, you know, there's the law. I'm going to explain this law in a moment. The Leverett marriage law. And he needs to act. And I'm going to make sure that he acts. Now, this is interesting. It's not Boaz that makes the move. But it's Naomi who says, this law has to be put into action. Someone has to make it happen, and I'm going to make it happen. Why did she do that? Why? Well, she knew God's law. That's the first thing. Secondly, she knew that their future was rather bleak. They're widows. They're childless widows. And widows had a hard time in those days. They have a hard time today. Imagine those days. So she goes, I need to act. I need to make sure that my daughter-in-law is taken care of and that the inheritance doesn't go lost. Now, someone may ask, why didn't Boaz make the move? Boaz was a man who feared the Lord. He was well-respected in the community. Why doesn't he go up to Ruth and say, look, I'm your relative. I can make this um, move, which is I can be your kinsman, which means relative, your kinsman redeemer, so that your inheritance doesn't go lost. I can give you an heir, and that heir will make sure that the land stays within the family. Why doesn't he do this? Well, some scholars say that Boaz could be at this point 60 years old. And she may have been around 25. They married rather young in those days. And it could be that she, he did not want to corner her into making this decision. So he just took it easy, basically. You know, most men do that. <laughs> most men take it easy. It's true that men are hunters, but in this case, he wasn't the hunter. It was Naomi doing everything, and Ruth was just executing. So we see, basically, that Ruth here is showing an exemplary attitude. So this is what we have. We have the plan. The plan is, basically, the mother-in-law says to Naomi, my daughter, 
Shall I not seek security? I want your future to be secure, that it may go well for you. Now then, Boaz, the field that you went to and belongs to this man, he is your relative, and he is winnowing barley at the threshing floor tonight. So she knew what Boaz was doing because all the men were doing the same thing that period. It's like when everybody's harvesting grapes, everybody's harvesting grapes because it's a, it's a vineyard kind of town. Or in this case, it was a barley and grain kind of town. So everybody was doing the same thing. And as I said, the life of the widow was hard. So here she says, this is the plan. Now, God's word says that in Proverbs 16, that the mind of a person plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Now, the plan that this woman, Naomi, had was a good plan because it had a biblical foundation. It wasn't just a plan that she hatched in her heart and she goes, you know what, let's see if we can seduce this man and try to get, to get him attracted to Ruth. Maybe she'll mar he'll marry her and maybe find her attractive. And you know what, our problems are solved. That wasn't the case. She was going along the lines of what God's word was saying. Now, the levirate marriage, that's what God's word explains, is found in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 5 and 6. So I'll read these two verses for you, and you could follow and open your Bibles, take notes if you wish. And it says, when brothers live together, and one of them dies and has no son. Now, in this case, it's the brother that is the kinsman. He's the, he's the relative. The wife of the deceased shall not be married outside the family to a strange man. Her husband's brother shall have relations with her and take her to himself as his wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. It shall then be that the firstborn to whom she gives birth shall assume the name of his father's deceased brother so that his name will not be wiped out from Israel. Now, if this person had no brother, then they would go to the cousin and so forth. In other words, always the closest of kin to the woman who is childless. That's the point. She had to be childless. And uh, this is called the Leverett marriage. And it was a, a law that was enshrined in the commandments that God had given to his people. Now, not everybody carried this out because it sometimes jeopardized your own family. And so the person who carried this out was doing it in obedience to God's word. So knowing full well that Boaz is a relative or kinsman, same thing, kinsman is an older word, but I, just, I prefer it, Naomi realizes that he can effectively carry out what Deuteronomy 25 verses 5 and 6 says here, because she knows this that Boaz has great esteem for this Moabite woman, right? He had already told her. He had already made sure that she's taken care of. He had already made sure that everyone would not touch her and respect her, even though she was a foreigner, a stranger to the land. So that's the plan. That's the plan that Naomi had based on what God's word revealed um, to God's people. Now the posture we see. Ruth, in verse 5 and 6, we read, And Ruth said to her, All that you say I will do. And so she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law had commanded her. I'm sure every mother-in-law would have loved to have a daughter-in-law that says exactly these words. <laughs> That's not necessarily the case, but it was for Ruth. Now, why did Ruth say this? Because Ruth saw that Naomi feared the Lord and saw that Naomi had come up with a plan that was based on the word of the Lord, the Leverett marriage law. And so Ruth acquiesces, takes the posture of humility, takes the, the, the decision to obey, and does what her mother-in-law is asking her. So it's a rare response, right? You know, you, you don't have uh, that kind of response today in many instances. I was listening to an interviewer not too long ago, and he was broaching a very difficult subject. He said these words. He goes, why is it that men are becoming, are shy, are shying away, rather, from responsibilities as fathers, as husbands, 
more and more, and women are becoming more assertive and go even as far as pushing their weight around. As he goes, that's the phenomenon we see today. He says, why is that happening? It's not a healthy thing. Well, here we don't see Naomi pushing her weight around. We don't see Ruth or manipulating the situation. We don't see them devising a scheme. None of that. What they did was obey the word and trust in God for the consequences. Because we don't know how this is going to turn out. This was a very difficult situation, a very difficult step. A very, uh, imagine this woman, she's uneasy, right? You know, this is not an easy thing. So there's no question that Ruth loves her mother-in-law. We already saw that last week. She's already told her, where you die, I will die. Where you sleep, in the house you sleep, I'm going to sleep. And your God will become my God. Your people will become your people. And I'm going to be with you. And only death will separate me from you. So she loved her mother-in-law. But she loved the God that her mother-in-law knew. And even though Naomi was not a, an excellent witness at first, and was weak in leaving Israel and going into Moab, she saw that Moab and Naomi was a wonderful woman. And so she tells her, all that you say, I will do. So she displays this humility and with an understanding that she, Naomi, had her best interest at heart. Now, of course, Naomi played a big part in Ruth's life and cultivated this, cultivated this wonderful relationship with Ruth that blossomed into a very strong bond. And therefore, we see Ruth having the right posture. God's word is very clear. If we're going to see his favor on our lives, we need the right posture. And the right posture here is one of humility. And I'm going to obey. Uh, even though I don't understand this, even though I'm not uh, familiar with this law, even though I don't fully comprehend the consequences, I'm going to trust this God, and I'm going to trust my mother-in-law who's just shared this law with me, and I'm going to trust that God is going to do what needs to be done as I obey him and put my faith in him. That's what basically we see is happening here. And so Naomi may have sensed also that Boaz felt awkward, didn't want to make the first move, so he goes, I'm going to help Boaz in this case. I'm going to make sure that the word of the Lord is followed, and I'm going to make sure that my daughter-in-law is taken care of, that there will be an heir that will receive the inheritance. She wasn't going to wait for Boaz to act. So that's the posture, one of action, one of humility, and obedience to the word. Now, let's read the next passage, which speaks to us of the persistence, the persistence. So she, meaning Ruth, went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law had commanded her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk, his heart was cheerful, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. And she came secretly and uncovered his feet and lay down. And it happened in the middle of the night that the man was startled and he bent forward and behold, a woman was lying at his feet. And so he said, who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your slave. I'll spread your garment over your slave, for you are a redeemer. Now, this whole passage is remarkable. Here's the first question that came to mind as I read this. Why didn't Ruth just, you know, walk up to him? Why did she have to wait till the, he fell asleep? And, and there he is sleeping with the other men who were taking care of this heap of grain, lest the thieves would come and steal it, right? That's why they did this. They stayed and guarded the heap of grain that they had worked so hard to, to um, harvest. So why is it that Ruth doesn't just go up to him and say, listen, you're my redeemer, you're my kinsman redeemer, and according to Deuteronomy chapter 25, there was no chapters in those days, but according to Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 5 and 6, you are to redeem me. Why doesn't she do that? Why doesn't, doesn't she openly do that? Well, there probably would have been a reaction. It would have put Boaz in a very awkward situation, you know, out in the open, and you know, so how do I, what do I answer this? How do I handle it, you know, in front of people? So that's why Naomi was quite wise. She goes, listen, this is what you're going to do. You're going to wait till he's eaten, he's drunk, and he's sleeping. And then you go, you're going to go to his feet, and you're going to place yourself at his feet in a perpendicular position to his body, basically. You're going to take his mantle, his, whatever he's covering himself with, whether it be his robe or a blanket, whatever it was, 
and cover yourself with that and wait. And it doesn't matter how awkward you feel. And it doesn't matter how smelly the feet may be. Right? Because they worked all day. You're going to stay there and wait. And you're not going to move until he wakes up. Now, you know, it's just an awkward plan. Because there she does exactly what she was afraid of doing. Remember, she was always uh, out, at a disadvantage because she was a foreigner. She wasn't one of God's people, right? She was a proselyte. She had converted to the faith and now had to learn God's ways. And there was a process. It took time for them to learn all of this. So what Naomi was asking her required courage from Ruth. And she had to overcome all her fear. Ruth was told to watch the place where Boaz would lie down. Why? There were many men working there. How would she know where he's lying down? We have to uncover each blanket and say, oh, you know, he couldn't do that. So he had, she had to keep spotting him while not being noticed that she was doing this. It was not easy. And there were a whole bunch of women there working, a whole bunch of men. People were moving. These were moving parts. And you can imagine Ruth, as she's working, she's keep looking at Boaz to see where he is amongst all these men and women that were in the field. She had to spot him, making sure that when the time came that he would rest after he had eaten and drunk, she knew exactly where he was, at the top of the hill where the grain was processed. See, there was a threshing floor. And this threshing floor was made of hard clay. And there was an ox there. And the thresh and the, the sheaves were brought. They were all in husks, right, the grain. And, and, the, and the ox would move a sled over these husks. And they would crack the husks so that the grain would be, shown, uh, would be exposed. And then people with forks or fan would lift up the husks into the air, typically in the afternoon when there was a breeze. And what would come down would be the grain and the husks and the chaff would be carried away by the wind. This was a long process that uh, was being carried out. And at the end of the day, um, when everything was done, they would celebrate, they would eat and drink all together. And this was a large community event. It wasn't just a few people gathered together. So she had to be alert. She had to overcome her fears. She had to overcome her hesitancy. When Ruth heard what was required of her, she answers, I will do it. I mean, promptly. She doesn't fight. She doesn't say, well, I've never done this. How am I going to do this? I'm going to play my, place myself at somebody's feet. This is so awkward. I will do it. I will obey. It's remarkable, the humility and the trust we see in Ruth. She had to overcome her inadequacy. She wasn't a Jew. She wasn't from Bethlehem. She wasn't from Judah. She was a Moabite. She wasn't wealthy. She wasn't in the same social status. Here's Boaz. He's well-known, respected, wealthy. Who is she? A nobody. So she had to overcome all her inadequacies. And um, it's remarkable when Boaz finally wakes up, he feels this thing at his feet, right? He goes, what's going on? And he wakes up and he gets from his sleep and he asks, who are you? I'm Ruth. And listen to her answer. I am Ruth, your slave. How does a slave usually answer? A slave doesn't have any boldness. A slave is very sheepish, you know. And I am Ruth, your slave. Now spread your garment over your slave. You are my redeemer. Wow. <laughs> That's just saying Deuteronomy 25, verses 5 and 6. You put it into action right now. I mean, it's, it's remarkable that the, the boldness and the clarity of mind that she had. Now, she must have been awake all that time. Uh, when is he going to wake up? When is he going to wake up? And he's just, she's just rehearsing what her mother-in-law told her, and she's playing it in her mind over and over. And then when that woman, man wakes up, bang, he hits him. Uh, she hits him hard. She was a servant, but she sure didn't speak like one. What boldness. It's wonderful to see the boldness in Ruth. She had to overcome her Fear of being judged. As I said earlier, she didn't want to do it openly. Naomi knew that, that would have put everything at risk. So she does it quietly. But imagine had anybody awoken, what's this woman doing here? We're only men. Because the men would be sleeping around the heap of grain while the woman would have gone back with the children into their tents. 
right? These were provisional tents for the harvest, harvesting time. So and upon determining who she was and after identifying her, herself, she could have said, he'll judge me. She could have said that. He'll refuse me. He'll make fun of me. He'll put me down. She just trusted the Lord. I think this is a great example for all of us who have to share the gospel. God's word is clear about sharing the gospel. We need to share it. But sometimes we have these fears and we have these questions and we're afraid they're going to put us down or they're going to make fun of us. I was listening to someone this morning who shared um, a story of a man who became a believer while in the States. And then because he had family in Italy, and in those days there was no phone or anything, he decided to leave his family in the States. He's like, I'll be back in a month. And uh, took the ship, went back to his hometown, and then shared the gospel with everybody he could. And, um, and, and in his, in his uh, memoirs, he shares how he was afraid. He was really afraid of how they would receive him because he loved his family. He loved his relatives and his cousins. And he goes, how will they receive me? Will they reject me? But the gospel had changed his life so much. He goes, I need to share the gospel. And when he came, he landed. He said, some people refused, but some believed. And he went back rejoicing back to the States. And now in that town in Italy, there's a flourishing church because of the testimony of one man. One man who overcame the fear of being judged, the fear of being criticized, or the fear of being mocked. And that's what we see in Ruth. She had to overcome all her fears of being judged and of being uh, uh, mocked. Why did she do this? How could she overcome her fears? Because she feared the Lord more. When we fear God more, we overcome our fears. So the fear of the Lord must be healthy in our lives. We need to constantly pray, let the fear of the Lord be in my life. Unite my heart, said David, to fear your name. In Proverbs 31, it speaks about woman whose charm is deceitful. Beauty is vain. Like it says, it doesn't tell us that uh, Ruth was a beautiful woman. It doesn't say that. The Old Testament typically is very specific when it comes to stuff like that. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. And that's what we see in Ruth. She feared the Lord. This God had gripped her heart. And she fell in love with his God. And she fell in love with his law. And she just wanted to obey. Notice now the praise. When he finds out what she just said, he is shocked to think that she, a Moabite, would take this kind of action, that she would make the move of reminding him what his duty was to obey the word of the Lord. And then he said, in verses 10 and 11, may you be blessed of the Lord, my daughter. You have shown your last kindness to be better than the first. What is the last kindness? Well, the first kindness was what, she, he did, what Ruth had done with Naomi. This last kindness was you're willing to sacrifice your desires to be remarried with a young man, whether rich or poor. He explains it. Notice. By not going after young men, whether poor or rich. So now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you whatever you say. For all my people in the city know that you are a woman of excellence. I mean, it's just a remarkable story as it unfolds. You know, he's stunned. He was already impressed with her that she had left Moab and the gods of Moab and had joined Israel as a foreigner and she wasn't... It's not that they were saying, oh, thank God, Ruth is here. No, there's no red carpet for Ruth. Nothing at all. Right? Oh, there's Ruth, the Moabite. Oh, that's strange. Why is she, she here? We know that the Moabites are cursed. They can't join God's people. Why would she make such a decision? Why would she even try to be with us? She knows this. Naomi must have told her. There she was. And that impressed Boaz. And now he's even more impressed and then Boaz reminds her first, not to worry. Don't be afraid. In other words, I know that right now you are afraid. I know that you may have had other thoughts, but you were bold enough to bring forth your request. And I am going to do exactly what you're saying. That's remarkable. Boaz is willing 
to do that which the word of the Lord is required of him to do. I'm, I'm sure he must have said to himself, who is this girl? Where does she come from? How can she be so firm in the word of God, so willing to obey it? I have been reluctant. I have been sheepish. I've, had, put, I've, had, I've asked myself so many things. Should I, what could I do to help them? I've helped them with generosity, but I should have gone more. I should have obeyed more. But here's Ruth. She's the one, the Moabite woman, who steps out in faith, in obedience. She shows what true obedience is. And then Boaz not only receives her, but reassures her. He responds to Ruth's request by telling that he will do everything necessary. And he meant it. And then she, he praises her. Boaz says these words, for all my people, meaning all the Israelites, because she was a Moabite, right? That had been converting to the faith of Israel. All my people, people of Israel, in the city, which means in Bethlehem, know that you are a woman of excellence. You're different. You are not like other women. You stand out. And that's why he goes, I'm going to go out of my way to make this happen. In other words, Boaz is saying, you're not like any other woman that I've ever met. And for you to want some old geezer like myself, just to obey God's word is remarkable, Ruth. I've never met someone like you. Ruth's amazing attitude along with her trust in God worked together to bring a miracle to pass. Now, Ruth could have gone after younger men. She could have said to her mother-in-law, look, I want to marry someone with whom I could have children. I love you. I love Israel. It's a wonderful place. I want to worship the true God. But, you know, when it comes to this Deuteronomy 25, 5 and 6, ah, you know, I'm, I'm not too crazy about this. Can I just marry someone I want to marry? Someone young? You know, I just want to have a life like everyone else. That was my dream. My first husband died. Now I got to do this. I, I got to go after Boaz. I got to, you know, just to fulfill Deuteronomy 25, 6. She could have said that, but we don't see any of that in her. We see a willingness to obey because she trusted the Lord. Hebrews 11, verse 6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please him. Ruth had faith. Faith that in following God's word, she would be rewarded. That's all it was, faith. For the one who comes to God must believe that he exists. Not only that he exists, but that he proves to be one who rewards those who seek him. And that's what Ruth had, faith. I'm going to follow God's word. I'm going to do the unconventional thing. I am not going to fulfill my own desires of having a husband that can take care of me and with whom I can spend the rest of the days. I will obey what God's word says, and I will raise an heir for the inheritance. And even if it's unconventional, even if it doesn't make any sense, I'm going to trust the Lord. That's what she did. Now look at the prospects. After a whole thing, after this dialogue with Boaz, she comes back home, and she comes to her mother-in-law in verse 16, and she said, Naomi asks, how did it go, my daughter? You can imagine how anxious she was back home. She was just as anxious as uh, Josie is anxious right now. And she told her all that the man had done for her. And she also said, these six measures of barley he gave to me. For he said, do not go to your mother-in-law empty-handed. And then she said, Naomi, <laughs> Naomi understood men. She said, wait, my daughter, until you know how the matter turns out. For the man will not rest until he has settled it today. In other words, he's not going to take his time with this. He's going to act pronto, quickly. So here's Ruth bringing back this news. And she doesn't know exactly what's going on. She doesn't know what's going to transpire from this moment on. How Boaz is going to meet the closest kin or the closest relative to Naomi. She doesn't know all this. This but. When Naomi hears what happened, she goes, this man's not going to rest because now he's taking a liking to you. Not only have you shown yourself to be a remarkable woman in, being, in, in leaving behind your people, the gods of your people, and becoming a person that now lives in Israel, embracing the faith that lead, that of, of Israel, the faith of, in the true God, but now you are exemplifying yourself by reminding him of his responsibility. 
you have caught his heart. Naomi understood that. Naomi was sure that Boaz was not going to delay in redeeming um, Ruth and Naomi, of course, in the process. Because Boaz had grown in his esteem exponentially for this woman. Those words that Boaz had said to her, for all my people in the city know that you are a woman of excellence, reveal that he has heard what they said about her. It's amazing. He's aware of what she may not have known. She goes, oh, really? They're saying this about me? <laughs> They're saying these things about me? See, when you do good, what you sow is going to be what you're going to reap. When you bless others, others will know. When you go out of your way for others, people will speak of you. When you are generous with others, people will know. When you think of yourself, when you are self-seeking and narcissistic, that too will come out. Depending how we live and what kind of life we flesh out in our daily walk, it will be known. People knew about Ruth, of her sacrifice, of her willingness to leave her land, to stay with her mother-in-law, and to sacrifice herself, whatever the cost. And now they were going to hear this, and they were going to bless her. They were going to bless her and praise God for her. I can imagine Naomi thinking to herself these words. Remember when she came back, she told these words to the people who called her, hey, Naomi, which means pleasant, right? Hey, welcome back. We're so happy to see you. What does she reply? Don't call me Naomi anymore. Call me Mara, bitter. There's nothing pleasant about my life. I've lost everything. I'm losing my inheritance. I've left full and I've come back empty. I've got nothing. I can imagine Naomi saying these words to herself. My, how God is at work in my life since I'm back where I ought to be. Back with God's people. Back where there is praise, Judah. Back in the house of bread, Bethlehem. I'm back and God is working in my life and in my daughter-in-law's life like this? Who could have imagined such mercy, such a merciful God? I don't deserve this. It's not that Naomi said, well, it's about time that God moves in my life. God owes us nothing but judgment. And yet God is so merciful. And when we repent and humble ourselves before him, he moves in ways we could never imagine. And here we see this remarkable response from Ruth and this remarkable heart and attitude from her towards the law of the Lord. And we see Naomi being encouraged through all of this and saying, wow, God is indeed working in my life. Ruth displayed a faith that pleases God. Naomi is in the as a spectator, watching, guiding, not manipulating, but trusting and waiting anxiously to see what God is going to do. All because she knew the word of the Lord. And that word, she passed it on to Ruth, and Ruth then passes it on to Boaz. That's what happened. Naomi bases herself and her plans on the word, passes it on to Ruth. Ruth believes Passes it on to Boaz and reminds him. And Boaz says, you're right. I'm going to do it. ASAP. God's word says, those who love your law have great peace. But what happens when we don't love his word? What happens when we neglect his word? What happens when we read it seldom or randomly? What happens? Well, we don't have great peace. Because great peace is for those who love the word. Those who are spending time reading and seeking to understand and storing that precious word in their hearts. And that's what we see happening in Ruth's life. May her example encourage us to discover, to know God's word and his will, and then to do it in our daily life. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, how can we thank you enough for this book that you gave us, the wonderful word of God. 
has been inspired by the Holy Spirit and is useful for our teaching, for our growth, so that we can be fully equipped to do your will. It corrects us, it reproves us, and it challenges us. And I pray that we would not forget this book, that we would cherish it, just like Ruth cherished your word and acted on it. Thank you for the Naomi's in our lives that encourage us, like Naomi encouraged Ruth. Thank you for those moments that you give us where we can put into action your word, even though we're afraid, even though we feel awkward, even though we may feel that people will mock us or make fun of us or put us down. Thank you for the courage you give us to follow your ways. And thank you for the reward that awaits all those who trust you, who place their faith in you. Lord, we look forward to seeing the reward in Ruth's life. We look forward to the reward that will happen to us as we obey you and put into action the will of the Lord. Give you glory, Lord. We think of those who perhaps are still in darkness right now, but you are drawing them to yourself. You are revealing your grace to them. You're showing them that you are calling them to be your children, to come out of darkness into the glorious light of the gospel. Oh, Heavenly Father, reveal your love to them so that they will not hold back from saying yes to the Heavenly Father. Draw them right now to the cross of Jesus Christ where they will see that their sins, as awful as they are, and as much as they are deserving of judgment, are forgiven and there now can become children of God. Be glorified, Lord, even today we pray. In the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.